Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Amit Hatsi, who's going to be speaking to us about path isomorphisms between quiver, hecker, and diagrammatic bot samuelson endomorphism algebras. Great. Uh, th thanks very much, Jay. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, this uh, workshop uh, and for adapting to it being virtual, which is like many, many, many things this year. Right. Um, so this, this talk is based on uh, a paper, which is joint work with uh, Chris Bowman and Anton Cox. Um, the title of, of my talk officially is the same as the title of the paper, so that it's easier to find. But and it, as a title, it's it's quite precise and you know as general as it should be. But perhaps uh, for the purpose of this talk, uh, we should change the title a little bit to be a bit easier to understand. So if we change some words, uh, we can. We're really talking about an isomorphism between the symmetric group algebra and um, endomorphism algebras of diagrammatic zirkel bind modules, or if you like. Um, endomorphism algebras in the diagrammatic HECA category. Right. So let's uh, introduce what this talk is going to be about with some motivation. Uh, let's take K to be a field of positive characteristic P. Let's let uh, SN be the symmetric group on N letters. Let's take S lambda uh, to be the spec module associated to a partition lambda of n. And uh, if lambda is a p regular partition, which is a certain combinatorial uh, condition on the partition, then let's write d lambda for the simple head of the spec module. It's part of the theory that these spec modules have a simple head. And finally, um, Let's write pH of n for the set of partitions of n with at most h rows. So a very old conjecture, well, maybe not so old, but uh, related to some old conjectures is uh, suppose you have uh, two partitions with at most h rows and that the characteristic p is bigger than the square root of n. Then James conjectured that the decomposition numbers of the symmetric group, so in other words, uh, the number of times each uh, simple module shows up inside each spec module, these numbers are given by uh, the by certain kinds of casualistic polynomials. Uh, to be precise, anti-spherical parabolic casualistic polynomials of type um, finite type A inside affine type A of rank uh, H minus one. So uh, if you don't know kind of all the details about all the details about the um description. Don't worry about it. We'll go over some of this a little bit more. Anyways, uh, we now know, due to the work of Williamson, that uh, the bounds for the James conjecture, conjecture are generically false. Um, the James conjecture, in, in some ways, can be viewed as the symmetric group's counterpart of uh, the listic conjecture for the general linear group. Right? It's it, it's it's just it's it's a version of what you get when you um, apply Sherville duality to uh, the, the list of conjecture. Um, but we do have some progress towards a replacement, which is true, which is correct uh, for, for James's conjecture. And instead of writing it out uh, in detail, right, writing it out all over again, I'll just uh, show what you need to change in order to get this to work. So um, we take uh, the characteristics to be bigger than H, the number of rows that we're um, looking at. And then instead of having casualistic polynomials, we need to work with something called P casualistic polynomials, which are denoted with a superscript P. Everything else in the theorem, though, is stays the same. right? And this is a relatively recent result due to Rich and Williamson. Um, right, so, so at this stage, uh, you know, why, why is this not a complete answer? Well. I haven't really told you what Picasso and Lustig polynomials are. And I'm not really going to in this talk because A, they're, they're really, really hard to calculate. And uh, B, that there isn't a huge amount of time to discuss precisely how they're defined. But what I do want to say is, uh, I want to say a little bit about where they come from. What, what do you need to define in order to have an actual valid definition of Picasso and Lustig polynomials? So, uh, the key ingredient for this is um, 
the diagrammatic category of zergo biomodules or the diagrammatic heavy category. So what is this? So suppose you have a Dinkin type W, maybe it's finite, maybe it's affine, maybe it's parabolic, which is like a, a finite type inside an affine uh, type, whatever. If you have this Dinkin type, then you can uh, construct an associated diagrammatic category, which we'll call um, calligraphic D, which is dependent on uh, this Dinkin type. And this is the this is uh, what I'll call the diagrammatic category of Zergel biomodules over, over your underlying field. Um, some people call it the diagrammatic heavy category. I'll stick to the um, language of Zergel biomodules. Um, so then uh, the corresponding p catalytic polynomials in that type are then defined using this category D. Okay, great. So I've said um, where PCAS and holistic polynomials come from in terms of the category, which maybe you also don't know a little uh, much about, but let me say some, I can say some, uh, something about where the category comes from, how people have thought about it over the years. So some ways to understand uh, D in order from, I'm gonna order them uh, from least useful for this talk to most useful to this talk. So, Less useful, but historically important due to Zergel is that um, the category of Zergel biomodules, maybe not the diagrammatic category, but the, the, actual, the category of classical Zergel biomodules uh, is an algebraic replacement for, the for a certain category of perverse sheaves on a flag variety of an algebraic group. And it's an algebraic replacement, which makes sense in all Dinkin types and in all fields. Um, yeah, we're not going to be doing, I guess, despite the, the name of this workshop, we're, we're not going to be doing as much geometry. So this, this viewpoint is less useful for us. Um, next, due to, um, uh, due to the work of Elias and Williamson and uh, Havanov and Libidinsky and many others working on the diagrammatics of these categories. If we're thinking specifically of the diagrammatic form of Zergel biomodules, then these diagrammatics give you a kind of generators and relations construction of a categorification of the Heck algebra corresponding to this um, Dickin type. Um, and then finally, most useful for us uh, is due to Rees and Williamson as related to um, the theorem I mentioned on the previous slide, which is that if you have a finite Dickin type W and you look at the um, the corresponding uh, diagrammatic category, the category, diagrammatic ca category corresponding to finite W living inside affine W, this anti-spherical quotient, then this category is equivalent to the category of uh, tilting modules for the corresponding algebraic group. Um, so this was originally conjectured by Riesch and Williamson. Um, and a character theoretic consequence of it was proven by Achara Makisumi, Rish and Williamson, and more recently, um, this equivalence in full generality, not just in type A, was proven by um, uh, Professor Kavnikov and Elias, I believe. Right, uh, so for, te for today, uh, the question uh, I'd like to ask is, the question I'd like to focus on is, uh, how can we understand this, the corresponding the, the corresponding diagrammatic category corresponding to finite type A inside affine type A. We want to understand this in the context in the context of the symmetric groups, not in the, the context of. Sorry. I just wanted to say the reference should be Bezukovnikov Rish. Bezukovnikov Rish. That sounds much more correct. Thanks, Torga. I, I forget these things sometimes. Yes, those are coffee coverage. Uh, yeah, so we want to understand um, this diagrammatic category in the context of the symmetric group directly. So this leads me to um, explain to uh, introduce uh, the main results of our paper. So suppose uh, that the characteristic is larger, strictly larger than h plus one, then. Uh, we have an explicit isomorphism 
um, between a certain endomorphism algebra inside um, this diagrammatic category to uh, an idempotent truncation of a quotient of the symmetric group algebra. And this explicit isomorphism is an isomorphism of graded cellular algebras. Uh, so there's a lot of notation here. So let me explain where what some of these things mean. So um, EH, which you can find kind of uh, inside the ideal that we're quotienting by on the right-hand side. Uh, this is an idempotent corresponding to um, looking at partitions with uh, uh, corresponding to killing partitions with more than H rows. Right, so the fact that we're looking at this quotient means that we only want to look at um, partitions with at most H rows. Uh, Fn, that's another idempotent. And it, it's uh, specifically, it's a, it's a truncation of the idempotent corresponding to the principal block of the symmetric group. Um, what are samples and bimodules? I mean, they, they come up in the official title of the talk. Uh, these are just the objects of the form B underline W. They're indexed by um, reduced expressions um, inside, uh, in, 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 inside this um, kind of parabolic root system uh, environment. Uh, next, the indexing set that we're taking our direct sum over for our Bopp Samuelson bimodules. Well, for each n, this indexing set is finite. But as n goes to infinity, uh, you will eventually cover all the bot samuelson bimodules. So really, this isomorphism um, covers the entire category. You're not missing anything. And then finally, um, very astute uh, viewers who have noticed uh, a little superscript BR, uh, which, stands, which uh, stands for breadth enhanced. This is a term that we came up with in the paper. And um, I'll say a little more on what this means later. It's, it turns it's going to be a variant of the diagrammatic category. Right. So uh, yeah, ne next uh, I'm going to explain uh, what the what the various objects on um, each side of this isomorphism mean as diagram algebras. So. Let's look at the right-hand side of the isomorphism. So that deals with the symmetric group. We want to think of the symmetric group as a diagram algebra, a graded diagram algebra. And in order to do this, we use um, the uh, a specific presentation. You can call it the cyclotomic K KLR algebra presentation, or maybe the cyclotomic clipper heck algebra presentation. Um, and this presentation is due to a celebrated result of Brundon and Kleshchev that you know, the symmetric group algebra and positive characteristic is, is graded. So uh, what, what does this presentation look like? Well, the symmetric group algebra is spanned by uh, wiring diagrams, which look a bit like this. And as a diagram algebra, it's um, generated um, by uh, straight lines and crossings. What do I mean by generated? I mean, uh, generated by horizontal and vertical concatenation, or if you like to think categorically, generated it as a monoidal category. And uh, what do the colors mean? The colors are, the strings of the di diagrams are colored by uh, residues mod P. And you can, you should think of, you can think of these resi residues as um, belonging to a, a cyclic quiver, uh, if you like. And, um, there are many, many relations. I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, here's an example of an interesting relation, though. Um, if you have two, um, if you have two residues which are adjacent to each other, so separated by plus or minus one mod p, then one interesting relation is uh, the deformed braid, braid relation, which says that you can take the difference between two braids and you'll get a strict line is idempotent. Okay, uh, the other side of the isomorphism, the left-hand side, this is going to be um, the, the diagrammatic category. So there's no dots in KLR because we have the certain cyclotomic quotient. That's right. There are no dots in KLR because we have a cyclotomic quotient. Um, yeah, sometimes they show up in calculations, but you don't need them to generate the algebra. 
So um, uh, the diagrammatic category, circle by modules, what do the diagrams look like? They look a bit like this. And um, they are generated kind of in a diagrammatic sense by the following sorts of basic uh, morphisms or elements. Here we go. So straight line idempotent, um, uh, a kind of dot morphism, a kind of trivalent or fork morphism, and two kinds of braids. Um, very astute people who are familiar with circle calculus will notice the um, second genera generating, it's a kind of generating morphism. It looks very strange. It's a kind of horizontal wiggle. And normally you don't talk about these sorts of things um, um, in the diagrammatic uh, circle category. Uh, this has to do with uh, breadth enhancement. And uh, again, I'll, I'll try and say a little more about what this means uh, later. But uh, trust me, it doesn't really add much more difficulty to the category. Um, you can think of this really as being like the bona fide um, diagrammatic circle category as defined. Um, by Elias and Williamson. Right, uh, so, uh, oh yes, and again, uh, these strings are also colored, um, but these colors are, are going to be different. These colors, um, these strings should be colored by the H simple roots of um, the affine root system corresponding to H minus one. And I'm gonna try and keep the, the sorts of colors uh, separate so that you can tell the difference between colors um, the colors of the strings for the symmetric group and colors of the strings for um, plot samples and endomorphism algebras. And uh, again, there are many, many relations, um, which I'm not going to go into in detail. Yes? Any questions? No? Okay. Uh, many relations. Um, here are some examples, some, some interesting ones. First, the first one tells you how you can combine um, trivalent or fork um, morphisms with braids. And the second one, the jones renzel relation, tells you how you can combine uh, spots with uh, braids. And there are a bunch more interesting ones, but that's enough for now. OK. So now that we ha know a little bit more about um, the uh, the objects on the two sides of the isomorphisms. Now we need to, now I, I'd like to say how the isomorphisms is defined. And to do that, we need to develop some combinatorics and specifically talk about paths, which is the other um, important element of the title of the talk. So to do that, we'll talk about root systems a bit. <clears throat> so um, really important is the affine root system, H minus one. And you can think about this um, as living inside a certain Euclidean space. Um, just take an H-dimensional <clears throat> Euclidean space and quotient out by the sum of all <clears throat> the basis elements. And then uh, the simple roots uh, for this affine root system are just given by um, the difference between the adjacent basis, basis elements. And you remember you uh, cycle uh, your basis elements around because affine type A is a very cyclical thing. Um, what does this have to do with um, the symmetric group partitions? Well, if we go back to H uh, row partitions, we can embed H row partitions into this Euclidean space. How do we do that? Just think of um, the size of each row and map it to an element, map it to a linear combination of, of epsilons. And uh, this mapping um, will take H row partitions and it'll map them to the dominant vial chamber for the finite root system uh, living inside the affine root system. And uh, an important part of this mapping is that um, the orbits of um, the affine vial group action shifted appropriately. Uh, will the orbits of, of, of these points will give you the corresponding p blocks of the symmetric group. So this is enough words. Let's see some pictures. So um, let's take uh, h to be three, n to be twenty-three, and p to be six. We're working combinatorially, so 
is fine if uh, p is not prime at this point. So uh, for convenience, uh, throughout the rest of this talk, I'm going to draw a tableau uh, sideways so that they fit on the page. So um, we have a partition on the right here, which has three columns, three rows, however you like to see it. And it's not too difficult to, to see that um, this partition corresponds to the point marked in red here. And these other points in black are uh, the, the or are the orbit of this point under the um, uh, action of the p affine, um, the, the, the p dilated affine um, uh, vial group of type A. And if we uh, label the boxes uh, in this tableau, if we label the boxes in this partition to, to get a tableau, then we can think of each, each of these boxes as corresponding to a step, either in the epsilon one direction, or the epsilon two direction, or the epsilon three direction. And this will give us a path to the point in red in the following way. So box one is in column one, so that's a step in the epsilon one direction. Box two is in the, is, is in the second column, so that's a step in the epsilon two direction. Three, four, five, six, and we can keep going. And eventually we'll finish at the point in question. Um, and now, uh, <clears throat> what do the colors uh, of the boxes of the partition mean? So these colors are just the colors of the residues modulo p. Colors of um, colors of the, of, of the residues of the boxes, right? The the difference of the column index minus the row index modulo p. And um, if you have a tableau with the same sequence of residues, then this will correspond to a path which uh, <clears throat> is related to the path that, I've, that we see here via the action of the corresponding affine um, vial group, right? So if we move boxes 21, 22, and 23 into the second column, then that gives us this point, which as you can see is just a reflection of, of the path we just saw. And similarly, if we move boxes 20, 21, and 22, 23 to the first column, uh, this goes all the way there. Um, great. So now we we know we understand better how to um, how to talk about uh, tableau as paths. Now we're going to restrict um, ourselves to only certain kinds of paths. So um, let's uh, look at a very similar, basically the same kind of picture. And now I've colored the walls. How have I colored the walls? I've colored the walls according to the affine roots, which are also the colors which label the string. They're also the colors for the strings uh, for the boss Samuelson and dimorphism algebra. Right, so there are three kinds of walls you can have here. So there are three kinds of colors, magenta, blue, and green. And uh, the points that I've labeled here, these are, uh, these are the points, these are the weights in the principal block. These are all in the same orbit. These are all in the orbit of the origin. And the paths that we're going to consider are going to be formed uh, by repeatedly concatenating just two h plus one different kinds of paths. So for each wall, we have a path which goes through that wall, which kind of goes in a zigzag fashion and then straight along. So for, for the magenta wall, we zigzag up to the magenta wall and then go straight through it to get um, to the end point just just across the magenta wall. And then also for uh, associated magenta, we have the folded up version of this path, which looks like this, where we zigzag all the way to the magenta wall. And then instead of going through it, we uh, go back down to the origin. And we do this sort of thing for each color. So for blue, we zigzag to the blue wall and then go through it. And then uh, we also fold that path up again. So zigzag to the blue wall and then go back. Uh, you might notice that um, this isn't a tableau anymore, but you can think of this as a skew tableau, so it's no big deal. And then for green, uh, same thing, zigzag to the green wall, and then uh, the folded up version of that path, which um, only goes to the green wall, but then goes back to the origin. So that gives you two H paths. H is three, two H is six, 
So I said two h plus one paths. What's the final path we need to consider? Well, it's it's just the do nothing path. It, it's this, the path which consists of going epsilon one, then epsilon two, and epsilon three, and returning back to the origin. And we can repeatedly concatenate these sorts of paths. And the idempotent Fn, which I mentioned before, uh, is the idempotent which restricts to these kinds of paths, the paths that you can obtain by concatenating them, all, all these sorts of paths. So for instance, you could have uh, the path which goes through the magenta wall, and then through the green wall, and then through the blue wall, and then through the magenta wall again, and then through the green, uh, through the blue, and then maybe a do-nothing path on the end of it. And then, uh, oh yeah, because we have these uh, flattened paths, we also have the kind of folded versions of these paths, which you get uh, by the action of the, um, the affine vial group, like that, for instance. Great. Uh, so this is all the combinatorics we need uh, for understanding paths. Now I want to talk about how the isomorphism works. So the first, so the first step towards understanding the isomorphism is to understand what the isomorphism what the isomorphism does to uh, Boss Hamilton objects, or if you like to think algebraically, what the isomorphism does to idempotents. So. Uh, to do that, we're going to use um, some of our path language. So uh, let's look at the, um, uh, if we look on the left here, let's look on the, um, the, uh, the object corresponding to a single magenta strand in the, on the Zergel side of things. And what does that map to on the symmetric group side of things? Well. Magenta, corres magenta corresponds to a path which goes through the magenta wall. But that path corresponds to a tableau. And that tableau gives you a residue sequence. And that residue sequence gives you um, a KLR item. And now, let's say we wanted to add a green strand on the Zergel side of things. Well, you just extend your path a little bit, which means you extend your tableau a little bit, which means you um, add a few more strands to your KLR style item. Potent. And we can keep doing this as much as we like. And this tells us, um, this gives us a correspondence between Ball Samuelson objects and uh, KLR uh, style idempotents in the symmetric group. OK, so that's objects. Now we want to go uh, a little bit deeper. How does the isomorphism work on um, generating morphisms? So, not. Um, Morphisms on the circle side of things, which uh, don't just consist of straight lines. Now, to do this is a little bit more complicated, but perfectly tractable. Uh, to do this, suppose we have two paths which terminate at the same point um, inside our Euclidean space. So, for, for instance, suppose P is five and we have um, two paths, first path being uh, the flattened magenta path. And the second path being the do nothing path repeated three times. So in pictures, the first path looks like this. So you zigzag all the way up to the magenta wall, but then instead of going through it, you reflect back down to the origin. And then uh, the second um, path is just three copies of the do nothing path. So do nothing, then do nothing, then do nothing. So these are. Um, these are paths to the same point, and in particular, um, the tableau uh, which make up these paths are, are tableau of the same shape, which means that uh, there's a bijection between the numbers in one tableau and the numbers in the other tableau. So we can write down this bijection and get a morphism on the KLR side of things. So uh, for instance, um, on the bottom of this diagram here, we have epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3. So that's the, um, the do nothing path repeated three times. And on the top, we have the flattened magenta path. And then we can think of the minimal step-preserving bijection between these paths. So minimal means no double crossings. 
step preserving means that uh, the first epsilon one step maps to the first epsilon one step, the second epsilon two, the first epsilon two step maps to the first epsilon two step, etc. And if we do that bijection, on the right hand side we get the following um, KLR style um, uh, basis element. And on the left hand side, what should we get? We should get something which goes from, uh, we should get a, a zergal diagram which corresponds to um, uh, nothing kind of on the bottom and a single magenta strand on the top. And it turns out that uh, the, um, the, thing, the thing we get under this isomorphism is the spot generator. And we can define uh, the other generators. We can define the image of the other um, generators for the bot Samuelson endomorphism algebras in a very similar way. So let's see another example. So let's consider the following path, um, go through the magenta wall and then, uh, and then compose that with the flattened magenta path. So the effect, the effect of that is zigzag to the, to the magenta wall, then go through the magenta wall, then zigzag back to the magenta wall, and then reflect uh, back. The end result is that you are one magenta wall away from the origin. So on the KLR side of things, we have um, P alpha, so going through the magenta wall, and the next, the flattened magenta path. And then on the top, uh, we should have some other kind of path. Here it is. The top path we're going to consider is going to be um, the do nothing path repeated three times, and then the magenta path. Right, and both of these paths end up at the same point, so we can do the exact same thing again. So uh, on our KLR diagram, let's put some do nothing paths on the top here, and then the magenta uh, path. And now these are two paths to the same point, so now we can think of the minimal step preserving bijection and we get a KLR diagram. And in this way, we defined um, the image of the fork, the trivalent generator of the Bob Samuelson endomorphism algebra. And in an entirely similar way, we can get uh, braiding um, the, the, the braid morphisms. So for instance, here's, a, here's an interesting path. It goes through magenta and then you know, green, then blue, then green, and then do nothing just uh, for fun. Now, we can, uh, we can also think of a path which instead of going through green and blue and green, goes through blue and green and blue, like that. Again, two paths to the same point. So we can get the minimal step preserving bijection. And this, this is the image of the uh, braid generator uh, inside the Bot Samuelson endomorphism algebra. Um, and in a similar way, you can do um, this for the um, four valent braid, the braid corresponding to two generators which commute. Uh, more interestingly though, um, we can do some interesting things with, uh, with our do nothing paths. So let's consider the path which goes through magenta, then blue, then green, then blue, and then the empty set again, the, the do nothing path. And instead of doing blue and then do nothing, we could have done do nothing and then blue. And that would have ended up at the same point. So we can write down the minimal step preserving uh, path for that and get a KLR generator. And this corresponds to the squiggles, uh, the kind of horizontal squiggles uh, that I mentioned um, when describing um, the diagrammatic bot Samuelson and the morphism algebra. Right, and this, this it turns out is what breadth enhancement uh, is, is, is really doing. It allows you to talk about uh, these sorts of squig squiggles, which um, uh, record, in some sense, how many times you do nothing. So I, I guess in a more, more categorical way, we can say that um, breadth enhancement is, when you, when you take the breadth enhancement of the, uh, this diagrammatic category, you're adding a new object, which corresponds to this do-nothing do path. And this new object is not the minor monoidal identity, but it is an element in the Drinfeld center. And it's, it's a particularly nice element in the, in the Drinfeld center that you're introducing. And because of this, it turns out that you're not really um, 
even though you're adding in a whole bunch of new objects, you're not really um, changing the morphisms between these objects, um, which is why you don't really need to know. Um, you, don't, you don't need to know anything special about breadth enhancement if you understand um, the diagrammatic cervical category. That's enough. And um, yeah, it, it, it turns out you need to record these things so that you can tell the difference between whether you're you know, first doing nothing and then doing an interesting path or doing an interesting path and then doing nothing. Right. So that covers all the generators. So that, in some sense, tells you uh, how the isomorphism works. But so it's, the final step is to say uh, how we develop the proof. So we've shown how to construct this map. Uh, to check that it's well-defined, you need to check the relations which define um, the breadth-enhanced diagrammatic category. Um, uh, this is a single sentence, but you know this took most of the paper. But it's, it is a fairly um, concrete sort of check. You know, there's a list of relations in um, uh, which, which define this category, and you just need to check those. And then now we need to know how this is an isomorphism. And to do that, we apply the following, which is uh, results uh, due to ourselves uh, with, due to myself, Chris Bowman, um, Anton Cox, and uh, Dimitris Michalidis which is that the image of the light leaves basis, um, particular well-known cellular basis for the diagrammatic circle category, is also a basis for this truncated uh, quotient of the symmetric group algebra. And then uh, once you have that, you have a map which maps a basis to a basis. So it's, it's clearly an isomorphism. And then to conclude, uh, I'll just like to finish up with some remarks. So what is the, why is this result interesting? I guess uh, one way I'd like to think it's interesting is that uh, this, this proof is, is elementary. Elementary in the same way that um, the proof of uh, Rundin and Kleshchev's isomorphism between the cyclotomic KLR algebra and the symmetric group algebra, you know, that proof was a proof just looking at generators and relations. That was a proof that, 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 that theoretically you could understand with just an undergraduate level of, of algebra. And in a, in a similar sort of way, our proof is, is similarly elementary. And in particular, it doesn't rely on any um, categorification results. Or, you know, categorification uh, results on the categorification of, um, um, of SL2 or SLP hat, which I think was a, a, an, an important point in Rich Williamson's uh, original proof. Um, next, what else can we say about this isomorphism? Um, if we're looking at the level of bilinear forms, so um, when introducing, when reviewing uh, the peak casualistic basis, or the peak canonical basis, if you like, and peak casualistic polynomials. Uh, Jensen and Williamson introduced, uh, talked about local intersection forms inside the di diagrammatic observable category. These are very mysterious things which you use to calculate peak casualistic polynomials. And this isomorphism, because it's so explicit, it tells you exactly, it tells you another way of interpreting these local intersection forms in terms of the symmetric group. Uh, more precisely, it tells you that these local these these forms are truncations of the classical cellular forms that you have on Schbeck modules. So, so this means that if, if you want to do peak Hausenlistic theory in type A and you only know the symmetric group, then that that's enough. Um, and then next, I should say about what happened more generally. We can actually generalize this isomorphism in higher levels. Uh, to higher level quotients of um, the quiver hack algebra of this affine type. Oh, that should be an H, not a P. Apologies. 
And to be more precise, if we look at the case of level L, so L multipartitions, and if we set H equal to one, so we're looking at L multipartitions, but with one row each, um, then this, then the isomorphism gives us an interpretation of um, the non-parabolic Picasso listic polynomials of affine type. And it tells us that these um, Picasso listic polynomials are the decomposition numbers um, for the generalized blob algebras of, of, of level L. And this is exactly the blob versus circle conjecture due to Lebedinsky and Plaza. And this was another motivation for, uh, for our work in addition to uh, understanding uh, Rich, Rich and Williamson's um, symmetric groups result. Rich and Williamson's uh, character formula in a more symmetric groups kind of way. Um, and on that note, uh, yeah, any questions? Great, thanks, Sami. Yeah, does anyone have any questions for the speaker? Okay, maybe I'll start by asking a question. Um, this, you mentioned this fact about um, that you, this Jensen Williamson intersection form is interpreted in, you can reinterpret it in terms of these cellular forms on the Specht modules. So mm -hmm. do you get, do you get any lever can you like get any leveraging by playing these two viewpoints off against each other or can you like so hmm, i'm not sure we haven't um kind of investigated this fully i guess yeah i i guess um the this is interesting this is primarily interesting in one direction so um stuff on the Zergel side of things is telling you stuff about the cellular form for, for spec modules, right? I guess the, the isomorphism is telling you that there is an interesting truncation which you can look at, and, and here it is. Um, I mean, presumably those cellular forms on spec modules are very hard to compute and understand, would be. Yes. <laughs> I've I never mean, tried to do it myself, but I could only imagine that it would be very difficult. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, at the, at the moment, the, the 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 upshot of this is that you know we have you know we had we, we thought that we had two really difficult kinds of cellular forms to calculate, and it turns out that we only have one. So that, that that's an improvement at least. That's a good upshot in my mind. I have a number of questions. Um, question one: uh, So if you're trying to do this backwards and you don't care about the box. So you just want to take one strand from the KLR algebra just all by itself and send it to something in Zirgle land. I mean, I know you're, it's not going to correspond to a full moving from here to here, so it can't be one of these thick red ones. But can you interpret this using your, I don't know, in the menorah diagram, partially localized world as like one small strand um, before you p-dilate the final group? Yeah, I'm. I'm not certain. I guess another an, another direction I'd like to go. I'd like to look at more is to see if um, we can expand this sort of isomorphism to work with um, with singular Zergo by modules. Um, but right, I guess it's kind of more like what uh, Yvonne and I do in our version okay. of this stuff. Um, okay. I was just curious if there was a relation, basically. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure kind of how, how it works with uh, that kind of dilation with, with matrix recursion, because um, I guess it's, so, so the number of steps that you take when doing these sorts of paths, it, it's, it doesn't feel very natural because of the sort of zigzagging um, behavior that you're, that you're doing when, when drawing these, these pictures. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure. I haven't looked at it in detail, but I, I don't think there would be a direct correspondence in, with that because of that basically in singular land though those zigzags might be straight lines <laughs> maybe um, another question have you have you looked at all about how the pdg structure interacts with this isomorphism uh no no i haven't not not yet um but um yeah i guess there there are a number of things to to yeah there, there are a number of things to, to, to look at, and that's definitely one of them. Uh, 
Are there any more questions? Okay. Uh, I have a kind of a technical question. Uh, sure. Uh, so at some point you have this magenta string on the circle uh, side, and it seems you can the, can corresponds to a path or the flattened version of, of this plot of this path. How do you, do you decide this? So, so in terms of yeah, so uh, let's see. Okay, so 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 in terms, yeah, the the basic answer is you don't, right? So um, if you have the so if you have the if you have the residue sequence for either the magenta path or it's flattening, they're they're both going to have the same residue sequence. But in terms of but in terms of objects within the isomorphism, it corresponds to a single magenta string strand. Um, so what do, what do I mean? Yeah, so, so for, for the purpose of the isomorphism, a magenta strand on the circle side always corresponds to the non-flattened path, the one which goes through the magenta wall. The only time that you consider um, uh, flattened paths is when you want to, want to define these generators using minimal step-preserving bijections. Does, does that make sense? Sorry, so, so the, the original path and the, the, the flattened path have the same target in KLR land or different targets? They have different targets. They have, right? the, they have the same target. Oh, they have the same target. I see. Yeah, they have the same residue sequence. Great. I, I guess the idea is, is that you, in terms of the isomorphism, you always interpret, you always only look at the non flattened paths, but if you, Kind of when you're looking at the isomorphism on, on objects, but if you want to look at what the isomorphism is doing to generators, then at that point you consider flattened paths. You you re you reinterpret uh, certain things as flattened paths, and then um, uh, use st minimal step-preserving bijections. Okay, thanks. Okay, we'll just give people two minutes more thinking time. Maybe one last question. So are there any, I mean, so you said you basically give a new proof, uh, proof for the character formulas. Like, do you have any assumptions on P or anything that come in from this? Uh, yeah, so um, I guess, uh, let, me, let me see if I can go back to the main results. So hold on, somewhere along here. So, okay, uh, yeah, the, the, the main assumption we need is that P is strictly bigger than H plus one, which I guess looks a little different than, you know, your usual P greater than or equal to H, or P greater than H. And yeah, the, the reason for this basically is that, um, uh, the, the, the reason we can't consider H plus one directly has to do with um, uh, the way the residue calculus works on uh, young Tableau. We, we want to make sure that, um, we want to make sure that the, 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 re the relevant cyclotomic quotient makes sense. And you often get these sorts of um, edge cases um, kind of right at, right at the boundary due to um, residue coincidences, um, coincidences between adjacent residues. But, but yeah, basically we, we don't need any, but besides that kind of extra slightly larger characteristic, uh, characteristic we don't have any other assumptions. If there were a singular version, that stuff would probably go away. Is, is what you're saying? Uh, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's not easy. I mean, <laughs> yes. or, or we should Williamson have the same sort of caveat, but that's something that's yeah. been done. Yes, I think. Su yes, su subject to kind of off by one sorts of considerations, I think we, you could get rid of the uh, the, char the characteristic assumption. The most part. So. Uh, and just a side remark, because even though you stated this with kind of the assumption p greater than h, 
I mean, the character formulas for tilting modules, I mean, by using Smith theory, they're now known for all primes. So like, you don't even need that assumption anymore. But this is like work of this year, I guess, by Seymour and Jordy. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, more difficult. So I, th 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 these are the assumptions we need. <laughs> they're, they're all right, <laughs> but not perfect. Yeah, I think if you wanted to get rid of these assumptions, you you would need a different, a slightly different presentation of the um, the right hand side, basically. And I, I don't happen to have that offhand, so. Okay, well. There are no more questions. Then let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>